In 2016, Kyle Adelman, who many of you might be familiar with, um, he is now the lead pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville. He was at that time the teaching pastor. But regardless, in 2016, Kyle Adelman wrote a book, and the title of his book was Not a Fan. And the premise that he made in that book was that he was saying, I am not a fan of Jesus, which as an isolated statement sounds really offensive. Right? For a pastor to say, I'm not a fan of Jesus. But what he was really saying was there's this mentality that has crept in the church where there's a huge number of people in our churches who are fans of Jesus, right? Yay, Jesus. And like, we'll come and sit in the stands, so to speak, on Sunday at the Jesus pep rally and like get juiced up for the week. But, but really, we're just spectators who like Jesus, like the idea of Jesus, like the idea of what Jesus can do for us, but when it comes time to follow him, that there are much less people who are in that list. And then the premise that he went with in that book, which is one of my favorites all time, was are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? And we want to explore that idea this morning in the message. And so the, the title of the message is No Turning Back. And we'll explore that in Scripture in a little bit. And, and the, the subtitle, or the idea we want to look at, the cost of discipleship. In fact, the passage of Scripture we're going to go to, um, if you want to go ahead and turn there, it's in Luke chapter 9, starting in, in chapter 57. In some translations, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, there's a subtitle that says, the cost of discipleship. In fact, you would often see this in Jesus' ministry. Jesus had crowds and throngs of people when he was doing miracles. Like the day Jesus is giving out a free lunch, 5,000 people, baby, not counting the women and children. Another instance in another passage where Jesus is giving out a free lunch, 4,000 people, not including the women and children. But there were much smaller crowds when Jesus started to make the cost really clear of what it actually meant to follow him. And if you remember, when we kind of almost relaunched after the flood, when we got back in this space, the Lord kind of gave us a vision for a new direction that he wanted us to take. He gave us a new logo. He gave us a mission statement. And, and the mission he gave us as a church is raising up disciples who further the kingdom of God. To raise up disciples is to do more than just make converts. Right? The, the call that, that the Lord has for us as a church is more, to do more than just get people in relationship with Jesus or get people in church. We want to do that, but then we want to raise them up and grow them as disciples who follow Jesus. And there's a difference between being a convert and being a disciple or a follower. Like a convert has entered into this transactional relationship of I've asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and he has forgiven me of my sins. But there is so much more than we've often settled for in American church culture in the Bible Belt. Jesus saved you, but he didn't save you to be a spectator in the stands on Sunday morning. He saved you to activate you and, and do what the second half of the mission statement the Lord gave us is to go out and, and further the kingdom of God. If you remember at the beginning of this year, we talked about discipleship. We talked about what it meant to be a disciple. We talked about some of the practices that the, that the early church really practiced to follow Rabbi Jesus. We talked about silence and solitude, and we talked about fasting, and we talked about prayer as these ways that we follow him. And you remember that, that phrasing, that, that for the early church, for, for disciples in this Jewish culture thousands of years ago, to be a disciple of, the, of a rabbi meant to walk so closely with that rabbi that you were walking in their dust, that you were covered in the dust of that rabbi because you were walking so closely in their steps. And when Jesus calls us to be a disciple of him, he's calling us to walk so closely to him that it is as if we're covered in his dust because we're walking so closely to him. I was just thinking through this and reasoning through some things in my mind, and I dropped just an isolated phrase on Facebook the other day. Talk is cheap. Obedience is costly. It's easy to say 
that we want to be a disciple and to follow Jesus, but to actually follow him sometimes is costly in our lives, but it is always worth the cost. It is always, if you need to think about it transactionally, it is always worth anything that he asks us to give up. It's always worth that to follow him in obedience. So when we get to Luke chapter 9, um, if you read just before this for context, we won't this morning, but if you read up above that, um, Jesus just had an interaction where he and his disciples are traveling toward Jerusalem, and, and they get into a village where the Bible says they did not receive them. In other words, when they got to that village, they were not treated hospitably, they were not welcomed, none of those things. And so they kept on going. So these interactions that we're going to read about this morning happen right after Jesus and the disciples go to a town where they were basically like, mm, not made to feel welcome. And so in Luke chapter 9, verses 50, we're going to go 57 to 62, but we're going to break it into three segments. Because Jesus has three different interactions with three different people as he's making this journey, as he's walking along with the disciples. So go to Luke 9, 57 and 58. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus and the disciples have just had this interaction where a town made them feel completely unwelcome. And then here comes the eager beaver. Here comes the happy, like, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. Like, that town might not have anything, but I, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, being Jesus, answered him back with one simple statement. The foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, if you're going to follow me, we're on this vagrant, vagabond journey. We're at the mercy of other people. We, we, we go from town to town and we have to find somewhere to stay. Like the Bible tells us, the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. Now what's up with this, Jesus? Because you would think, after Jesus was just essentially rejected by an entire town, he would be really glad to find this guy who says, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus. But can I tell you this morning that people can in appear enthusiastic without actually being committed to it? And that's what we find in this man. Oh, the outward appearance is, oh, Jesus, I want to follow you. Come, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus looks straight to his heart and comes back with this one sentence. Like, it is possible to want to follow Jesus because it seems exciting. It is possible to want to follow Jesus because it seems beneficial. It, 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 and sometimes it's the journey or it's the benefits that we can get from Jesus that attract us instead of Jesus himself. And you've got to remember what's going on contextually, right? It, this is the period of Jesus' three years of earthly ministry. So to be one of Jesus' followers would mean you're going to get a front row seat to all the miracles, all those sassy confrontations with the religious people, all of the raising of the dead, all the sermons. You're going to have a front row seat to all of the action that's, pro that's going on. And when you read Bible scholars who so often will help us to have context and understand a scripture better than if we just read it cold by ourselves on the other side of the world 2,000 years later, like, it is said there in Luke 9 um, that someone said to him, or in some translations it'll say, a certain man said to him. Luke says that here, but most scholars agree this is the same guy that Matthew's talking about in Matthew 8, 19. And in Matthew 8, 19, he says it was a scribe. It was a scribe that said this to Jesus. Now, what did scribes do in, in that culture? They drafted legal documents. They were experts on the law. Um, in fact, they made copies of the scriptures on the papyrus and the, the different materials that they had. In other words, this guy would have been a pretty important dude who was used to a pretty comfortable life. And when he says, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go, I'll be, what he's essentially saying by saying that is, I'll be your disciple and you be my rabbi, right? Walking in the dust. Scholars, many scholars agree that it's likely that if this guy was a scribe, 
he saw an opportunity to attach himself to this religious teacher who was rising in power <laughs> and make a political move. And yet, he comes with this eager beaver like, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, oh, will you? Because even foxes have got dens to go into and birds have got nests, but I got nothing. Like, if you follow me, we got nothing. We show up in a town, we hope for the best, we, we get a tent, we find somebody's house to sleep in, we lay our head on a rock, we do what we got to do. And you know what's interesting? We never hear from this man again. There's no next verse where the man, he didn't, like, this is not even recorded that he said, thanks, but no thanks, Jesus. <laughs> like, like the, the going understanding in scripture is this guy like, hmm. <laughs> dropped his in deuces. He dropped his head and was like, you know what, just, 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 you know what, I, I, when he learned the cost of discipleship, he counted that cost and he wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. Because again, talk is cheap, but obedience is costly. It's, it's one thing to say you want to follow Jesus, but it is another thing entirely to actually walk it out in your daily lives. So in these three people, in, in this passage that we're reading from Luke chapter 9, I want to give you um, three costs that, that following Jesus will cost us. And the first one is this, it will cost us our comfort. Now, I'm not telling you Jesus is going to say, sell your house and go into itinerant ministry or give everything you have away and go sleep on the streets. I'm not saying that in like a literal take it over kind of sense, but it will cost you your comfort. Following Jesus is not comfortable. Being a fan of Jesus is comfortable. Ooh, that's, that gave me warm and fuzzy feelings when we worship this morning. And ah, oh, Josh was kind of funny and scattered. I bet he had a lot of coffee this morning. And like, just to sit on the fringes and just kind of like, that doesn't cost you anything. But to walk in obedience, when the Lord begins to put his thumb on something and say, hey, you need to give this up. Hey, you need to stop watching that hey, that relationship is not really growing you. You need to step back from that. Sometimes in our walk with him, it will cost us things. Yes, Discipleship is costly. It costs us our comfort. But you know what? Comfort zones are where things go to die. We weren't called to a stagnant Christianity of just being isolated off by ourselves and hoping for the best. We're in a growth process. And so if you're looking for a cushy, comfortable, happy, go lucky, tiptoe through the tulips, no issues, nothing makes you uncomfortable kind of life, following Jesus is probably not for you. But if you are looking for an adventure with the King of Glory who wants to use you to reach a lost world and, and minister through you and, and speak to people through you, man, it's an adventure. But it's not comfortable. And ultimately, this man said he wanted to follow Jesus until there was a cost, and then it was, he was out. When it was going to cost his comfort, 86 that, Jesus, I'm good. And we read that story, but I wonder how many times do we walk that out? There's another man in the next two verses, verses 59 and 60. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now this one. Like you read this one at a cursory level and you don't get a little cultural understanding. We're going now, for real, Jesus? Like this is, I mean, this is a little bit much. And it seems really odd to us. It, it, we almost feel like Jesus is being like crude and rude and, and insensitive. Um, but it's interesting. First guy comes talking a big game. I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus. Jesus comes back with one sentence. Dude walks away with his tail tucked between his legs. Didn't forget that. Then Jesus looks immediately at another guy and says, follow me. And he comes back with this conversation of, well now, Lord, let me first, let me go and let me, let me bury my father. It's not the call of Jesus. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is beginning to call his disciples, and he goes to, to Peter and Andrew, and he utters that phrase, follow me, and the Bible says they dropped their nets and followed him. 
Like they're in the process of doing what they did for their livelihood. And when Jesus said, follow me, they dropped the nets and they followed him. There's a difference in the responses in those two instances. And imagine, imagine getting this call from Jesus and him looking you dead in the eyes, like Jesus locking eyes with you and saying, follow me which was an invitation as a rabbi of come be my disciple and do life with me and learn from me and let me impart and pour into you. But this guy says, now, now, Jesus, let me, let me first go and bury my father. On the surface, that seems like this dude has a pretty legitimate point, right? And in Jewish culture, the relationship between a father and his heirs, very tight, very structured. Um, there were a lot of expectations about what you would do. And so a son was very responsible for that last act of sonship of burying his father. But scholars almost universally agree the man's not dead, okay? Um, because if it was the mourning period after a death, before a burial, the son would not have been out in public like happy-go-lucky listening to Jesus teach. Like their, their culture had very strict processes of grieving and mourning that that son would have been going through. You want to know a really gross detail that I didn't want to know, but if I have to know, I'm going to tell you too. Found, I mean, I read this in a commentary this morning that like six something and was like, whoo. Um, if this dad was near death, and we're assuming he hadn't died yet, but even if he had, in Jewish culture, they would bury a person, and they would leave them for a year, and then they'd come back and dig them up. Because at that point, all of the flesh and everything had rotted off, and then they would take the bones out of that mess, and they would clean them up and go rebury them together in a different thing, in a different slot in the tomb, which is super gross. But with that in mind, this guy could have been saying, hey, Jesus, it might be a year or more, because Pops is still going. So it could be a year or more before we do all that, and then I come back in the bones and the whole thing. So maybe in like a year, year and a half, we'll see how things go. Then maybe then I'll follow you, Jesus. It was as if the son was saying, let me go back home and spend some time with Dad, and, and when he's gone and everything's done, then I'll follow you. It's also very likely in Jewish culture that he wanted to be around when dad was gone to make sure that he got the inheritance. And then doesn't it start to sound a lot like the first man? Like it sounded really noble, like, oh, the dying. F Jesus, again, pff, looks straight into the heart. Like there's nothing wrong with being a family person. Unless it prevents us from following Jesus. Unless our commitment to them supersedes what Jesus has called us to, where we get this like misplaced priority in our life that really becomes idolatry. And that's really what Jesus calls out in this passage. Also, to reject your father's burial hmm, and let somebody else do it, like Jesus would say, it would be a total rejection of traditions. And it's almost as if Jesus makes this call of, hey, following me is more important than your traditions. Following me is more important than your family obligations. Following me is more important than your financial stability with the inheritance. Following me is more important than all of those things. See, the second cost of discipleship that Jesus is pointing out with this man is the cost to our priorities. Like, like the fundamental problem that this man had was his priorities were flipped. Son of God in the flesh looks him in the eyes and says, follow me. And he wants to follow Jesus on his own terms. Newsflash. That cannot be the case. We cannot follow Jesus on our own terms. In fact, there in verse 60, Jesus says, Let the dead bury their dead, but for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus says, The most important thing I'm calling you to do is go share the kingdom, spread the kingdom. And what's the mission that Jesus gave us as a church? Raising up disciples who further the kingdom of God. It's the most important thing in his eyes. And if this guy's really spiritually alive and understanding what Jesus is putting down, then he's being called to leave something that can be dealt with by other people 
and go do the task that Jesus has called him to do. I love the mirror translation, Francois de Troyes, this French guy. Um, I love how he translates the, this verse. He says, your mission is to awaken people out of their spiritual slumber with the good news, not to bury them. The most important thing you can do is raise people up to life, not to invest all of your time in, in burying them. And so it's not just, it's not just our, our home comforts that we need to be willing to sacrifice, but all of our priorities. And we have to place priority on the call that Jesus has given us to go and proclaim the kingdom. I think misplaced priorities is a huge issue in the modern church. Fans, we love the idea of Jesus. We love the idea of church. We love the idea of, of following him and giving the kingdom away until anything else comes in conflict with it. And then we just automatically pick the anything else. Misplaced priorities. That's what Jesus is calling out in this fellow. And I think Holy Spirit is going to help us to see things in our lives that maybe he's recalibrating and realigning this morning. Then there's a third guy, verses 61 and 62. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, it's like... This is sassy Jesus in these six verses. He ain't playing. Hey, there's no wiggle room. I mean, the guy just says, like, let me go kiss mom goodbye. Let me go tell everybody bye, and then I'll come. He's not asking for a year to go do the weird bone thing. Like, just let me go <laughs> tell everybody bye. And Jesus comes back with this, like, mm-mm. And, like, Jesus is over, too, at this point. And then this third guy approaches. I'll follow you wherever you go. No, he won't. Jesus turns to the second guy, follow me. Ain't happening. And now there's this third guy who we can only assume has probably heard the first two conversations the way that it's written. And he starts out strong. I will follow you, Lord. And then he immediately shows he has a huge butt. With one T, not two. Right? He has this excuse I'll follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back home and tell everybody goodbye. <laughs> he's locked eyes with Jesus, who's calling him to be his disciple, and he's trying to negotiate. In case you needed the newsflash, Jesus is not interested in your negotiations. He calls the shots. He is Lord. And there's a cost to our comfort in following Jesus. There's a shift needed in our priorities in following Jesus. And I think what we see in these verses is that there's a cost in our commitment if we're going to follow Jesus. And again, this seems like it would be super harsh. Because the man wants to follow. He just says, hey, let me go say goodbye to my family really quick. And we think for us, like, you know, I'd drive home real quick pack a bag or two, tell everybody goodbye, tell everybody what I'm going. I'd be back in an hour, no big deal. You ever heard of the Southern goodbye? A goodbye in Jewish culture was infinitely longer. Like it was like, hey Jesus, let me go do this thing and like in a season I'll come back and I'll follow you. It would have been a prolonged goodbye over, over probably days or even weeks. I think the key aspect of this third guy is not what he was turning back to. It wasn't that he was turning back to family. It was that he was turning back at all. That he's looking forward to this call that Jesus gives him, and he immediately starts looking back at what he's going to leave behind. And what is the title of the message this morning? No turning back. And so when he says that, Jesus comes with this really interestingly specific reply in verse 62. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when it's not 473 degrees, I actually enjoy mowing the grass. There's a certain level at which this does not enjoy the heat. 
But at its core root, I actually enjoy mowing the grass because there is something oddly satisfying about getting the line straight. There's something like when you can get those first couple rows just in line and then you're just podcasting or nothing and you're just humming along in the glory of God, making perfectly straight lines. Like there is something there. To do that, you've got to choose a point of focus at the start. And once you start, you've got to stick with it. If you start looking back, looking to the left, looking to the right, suddenly you veered in and this thing looks like a dog leg. And Jesus kind of uses that analogy here. But in that Jewish agrarian culture, he's talking about plowing, right? To, to help us to see that commitment and focus is key to following him. When you were plowing in that culture, if you took your eyes off of that fixed point really quickly, right, you'll veer off to the left or to the right. And when the people that Jesus is talking to, that's why he so often used agricultural parables, like the sower and the seed and the mustard seed. Like Jesus is always using these agricultural parables because he was speaking to people in an agricultural society. And so they would have gotten the plow reference. They would, they would have understood exactly what, what Jesus was saying. You know what's wild? In 1 Kings chapter 19, you don't have to go there, but in 1 Kings chapter 19, um, when Elijah found Elisha plowing, Elijah called Elisha to follow him. And you know what Elisha said? Let me say goodbye to my family first weird. You know what Elijah said? Okay, go ahead and come back. So Jesus, by using that specific way of phrasing things about the plow, the exact same thing that happened with Elijah and Elisha, Jesus is saying, hey, what I'm calling you to is more than what Elijah called Elisha to. We're going into a new thing. We're going into a new level of depth and a new level of power. This is more than just the call of a radical prophet. It is the call from the Son of God. It's a call to more. That same verse in the Passion Translation, Brian Simmons says it this way, Why do you keep looking back at your past and have second thoughts about following me? If you turn your back, you're not fit for God's kingdom. That's why Jesus' response is so strong here. If you're looking back, you're not 100% committed to following me. You're, you're going to really quickly, if you do that, move off course in following me. You're going you're gonna to stumble. Following Jesus as a disciple requires surrendering our commitments. It requires kind of realigning them so that he can maintain the first place in our lives. And I think what the Lord would say to us this morning is, there's a danger of slipping into just being a fan. It's really easy to be a fan in church. Like, it is, it is not a radical thing to be like, yay, Jesus. Woo. Like, I love Jesus. I love the stuff he does. But when he calls me to step out radically and pray for this person, when he calls me to step out radically and start a ministry, when he, when he calls me to step out radically and, and give up this area of my life, when he, whatever it may be, we kind of... Mm. And sometimes we're not willing to pay the price of obedience. And talk is cheap, but obedience is costly. It's the difference between being a convert versus being a disciple. Like, man, I want to see people come to know Jesus as their Savior. It is the call of the church, but it is also the call to raise them up as disciples. We were never meant to leave people in just a saved condition, like, all right, hang out for a few decades and then come to glory. No, we're, raised to, we're called to raise those people up as disciples and root them and ground them to help walk this life out and give the kingdom away. And there's a difference. And Jesus gave us free will. And he will allow us to wander through life without ever actually following him if we make that choice. But he loves us enough. And he has enough grace and he has enough mercy that he brings us to moments like this this morning. And he says, hey, let's, let's evaluate this for a second. And Holy Spirit begins to whisper to us, there is so much more that I have for you. 
And I think that's where the Lord has us this morning. We started out the year uh, in January for several weeks talking about becoming disciples. And here we are now in August. We get back into the rhythm of school and work as we enter into the fall. And he's bringing up this idea of discipleship again. Specifically this morning, this idea of, of what, it, what we give up, what we surrender, what we sacrifice, what we lay down to truly follow him. I can testify and tell you this morning, it is so completely, absolutely worth it to lay down anything he calls and follow him. And I know so many of you can give me that, those same stories and those same testimonies that it has always been worth it to give up anything he called, anything he asked, anything he put his thumb on, anything he redirected from. But there's a cost to following Jesus. I think, it's, I think it's unfair for us to not teach that in the church when Jesus himself laid it out, three guys in six verses, and tried to make it clear to us. There is a cost to truly following him. But it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful life that he's calling us to. So I think it's important to take time to respond to what the Lord's doing. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. There's nothing mystical or magical about that. One, it helps us to shut out some distractions. Two, it helps us to feel just a sense of, of privacy to listen to the Lord and respond. The first call always is this. Is there anybody this morning who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus? I've never been saved, and we're not, I'm not at the point of discipleship or following. I've, I've never had a relationship with Jesus. I've never become a Christian. If that's you, would you just slip your hands up? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I want to know where we are and, and minister in the room and shepherd this morning. Okay. Second thing, I wonder if there'd be anybody who feels like any of these people that Jesus interacted with. Hands all over the room. Anybody who would say, I feel like one or more of these people, I feel like I've drifted into a fan, but I've sometimes not been willing to give it all up, and I want to follow him. So many hands across the room this morning. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We're just going to go into a time of response. We say the altar's open. We don't actually have a piece of furniture called the altar. It's just these steps around the front of the, of the platform. But there's something powerful that happens when we make a step and we begin to come forward and, and the Lord comes down and meets with us here. So maybe you want to come to the altar this morning. Paul in Romans 12 talked about in this new covenant that we are the sacrifices, that we're living sacrifices. We lay ourselves before him. Maybe you want to do that this morning. Maybe you need to repent and say, Lord, there's been areas in my life when I've tried to maintain control. I've, I've tried to, to hold on to. I've, I've shrunk back from from really giving it over to and following you, and I want to give that to you. I want to follow you wholeheartedly. Whatever it is, you know. Holy Spirit's been faithful. He's in the room. He's speaking into hearts this morning. And so I would invite you as we worship, if the Lord's speaking to your heart, man, would you just respond? I'd encourage you to come. But you can respond right where you are. Maybe you want to ask somebody to come and pray with you. I'm going to be happy to come and make my way and pray with you. The most important thing we can do when the Lord speaks is to respond. We never want to just rush out the door and go on about our business. We want to take time to sit with it and respond and encounter him and let him move. And so he's speaking to hearts this morning. Let me say this. He's not mad at you. He's not angry. He's not sitting there in, in guilt and shame and condemnation. In love and grace and mercy, he's just calling you to higher. He's just calling you to more. He's just calling you up to the life and the plan he designed for you. He loves you so much that he's putting his thumb on some things this morning and say, hey, let's deal with this. And so whatever it is, would you just respond in obedience? If, I, if everything's clear for you, let's just worship. Let's just pray. Pray for those who the Lord's speaking to and ministering to. But let's, let's make this a holy time of responding to what the Lord has said. Just be obedient as we worship and as we pray.